Jubilee has been one of the most challenging heroes I have played in a long, long time. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Nelson All Over Cards. Today we're going to be diving in to the newest hero in our beloved game, Jubilee. We're going to be discussing her kit, talk about some of the auto includes in that basic package, rank each one of the aspects, and then talk about her overall ranking in Marvel Champions. Now this is primarily a focus on a solo review, true solo but we will talk a little bit about how she works in multiplayer later in the video. And I got some thoughts around multiplayer, so it's going to be pretty fun. But let's dive in and talk about her alter ego, Jubilation Lee. It's a bit unfortunate that this is where we have to begin the review because this is the part of her kit that starts to highlight her biggest weakness, her squish ability, which totally should be a real word. She has nine hit points and only a recovery of three. So we really need to be careful with her health, and this is gonna be a common theme throughout the video. She has an alter ego action called Maul Rat, which allows her to search her deck for her signature side scheme called Shopping Spree, which is a zero cost player side scheme, comes with two threats, it has an action that any alter ego, and it does not have to be Jubilee, if you're playing in multiplayer, hint, hint, can exhaust to remove one threat. The other stipulation is that uh, threat cannot be thwarted by heroes or allies. This requires some interesting deck building, so you can get around it in some senses with like some supports or like Gambit using his alter ego ability to, to remove threat, but it can be kind of hard to clear threat off of it. But the player who does clear that threat gets to search their deck and discard pile for an item traded card and put it into play. I will go ahead and say that this can be a trap in true solo. There are two cards in her kit that she can grab, both of which are great, and we'll get to those later, but the cost to clear this is pretty tough. Now, we talked about some of those tricks. You can use supports like Beat Cop or Surveillance Team or something to remove threats, which can make it a lot easier to play, and I absolutely would recommend if you are going to try and exploit uh, Shopping Spree to use some tricks like that. Or if you're going multiplayer, you have tricks there. But unless we're building around clearing this player's side scheme, I've found that in most of my games, I pull it out of my deck, maybe clear one threat of it, threat off of it on turn one, and then leave it until we flip back down on turn two or three and maybe clear it then. The exhaust as the cost to remove the threat can be pretty high, especially when that villain is putting a lot of pressure on you early in the game. I very rarely cleared it more than one time in my solar games. I guess I should say, and still won that game, but I will pull it out again and throw it on the table to thin my deck. I was really excited about the card, and don't get me wrong, it can be really good in multiplayer, but in solo, it kind of fell flat. The tempo loss from exhausting to clear, and you have to exhaust twice to remove the threat, is pretty hard to recover from. Um, so I typically am looking at this as a nice to have rather than I'm gonna be building my entire strategy around clearing shopping spree. But when we flip her over to her hero form, we'll see a pretty poor one thwart, one attack, and again, highlighting our biggest weakness here, two defense stat. But that poor stat line is a bit offset by her printed ability called Like Totally, which requires her to exhaust to generate a wild resource. Having an onboard resource generator is strong, and the fact that it's wild is great because that's what Jubilee's main shtick is, paying for events with multiple different resource icons. So the flexibility of the wild here is very much appreciated. And we will talk about her events here in a second, but before we do, we have to talk about those two targets that I talked about before, the targets for shopping spree in her kit. She has her coat and her glasses. For her coat, this is probably my favorite card in her kit. It gives her a plus one thwart, so it bumps that thwart up to a two, and it gives her a response, and this response is the critical part of the coat that says, after you play a thwart event, you can exhaust the coat to remove one threat from a scheme for each different resource type used to pay for that event. This is insane, and the main reason that I don't just write off shopping spree and true solo. I do like being able to get the coat out early because it just relieves so much pressure. I love to be able to like maybe use an event to uh, take out a side scheme and then use the coast response to clean up the main. And in true solo, the flexibility of where you can put that meta threat mitigation is really nice. And she has a ton of different ways to generate different resource icons. So we can usually get some pretty good impact out of this card. The glasses on the other hand are the other item card. Very similar to the coat, but for attack events, it's gonna give her a plus one attack. 
and then instead of removing threat, it deals damage for each resource type spent to pay for the attack that triggers its response. This is good, it's not as impactful as her coat in my opinion. If we get like some crazy high minion scenario, I do like to grab these glasses to help clear them out, but my first option pretty much as a rule of thumb is to use shopping spree or superpower training to get her coat out. And then if we can get her glasses, that's nice to have, but not as important as the coat. That's what I have found. The one thing that helps Jubilee offset her quote squishiness is her access to status condition. And that's the other way her kit is kind of pulling her. Take firecracker, one of her attack events, for example, it's a two cost event that deals four damage. And then if you pay for the event using two different resource types, then you get to stun the attacked enemy. It's pretty great value if you can get that kicker. And if the enemy that we stun is the villain, which a lot of the times we are gonna be trying to trigger, then we don't have to worry as much about her low defensive stat line. Also, don't forget about her glasses. So once she is built out, you play that upgrade, you can play Firecracker for two, deal four damage, stun the enemy, exhaust the glasses, and deal two more damage to either that or a different enemy. It's pretty awesome and very, very satisfying to pull off once it's set up. The Mirror to Firecracker is her thwart event, Flash of Light. Another two cost event that removes three threat from a scheme. If you use two different resources, you get to confuse an enemy. If you've watched the channel before, you know how much I love confuse. It's so good, especially in solo, allowing you to flip back down, take uh, advantage of all your alter ego mutant supports. Mm. And then you can combo this with a coat. It's a lot of threat removal, especially for solo. With the Confuse, the prevention of threat removal, Jubilee can manage threat. It should be noted that she has three copies of each of these events, and each of the copies has a different printed resource icon, which helps her pay for all the rest of her events and everything that you're deck building with, with multiple different icons. So the firecracker is not all physical. There's a lightning physical and mental, so you're able to have that diversity in resources. Her ability to status lock the villain is rivaled by very few in the game, which is her saving grace. When we are fighting a non-stalwart steady villain, Jubilee already has a lot of options to apply those status conditions, and that's before we even start to talk about Blinding Flash, which is an AOE status slot, which is a sentence I just absolutely love to say. Three cost event that allows you to choose up to X enemies, where X is the total number of different resources types used to favor this event, which is a sentence I had to practice frequently before this review, and stun and confuse each one of those enemies. So typically, if you're gonna be able to pay for it with three different events, you can status lock three different enemies, stun and confuse. Honestly, if we can just get the villain locked down with this, it isn't an awful value. I'm paying three for a stun and a confuse, blocking two activations. I don't hate that, but we can hit a big minion as well, or multiple villains in a multi-villain scenario, then we're cooking and it's fun, it's satisfying. I did it in uh, Four Horsemen, I was able to status lock three of them. It, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome, I, I really enjoyed that, that was fun. The last event in her kit is called Grand Finality. It's a three cost attack event that deals two damage to an enemy. And then for each different resource you choose, are you paid for it? You can choose an enemy and deal two damage to it. So this can be a swinging web kick, just straight up. If you target the same enemy, eight damage, or the ultimate minion clear if you choose different ones because you can choose different enemies for each instance of damage. But my favorite thing here is that if you use a card that buffs events damage, say like aggressive energy or keep up the pressure or something like that, each instance of damage is buffed. So with an aggressive energy, it now becomes a three cost card for 12 damage. And that's before we even add the glasses into the equation. So I'm typically using this as like a finisher card. It's pretty freaking good at that. She has three versions of plasmoid energy, which are doubles that have different resources on them, making it pretty easy for her to hit all the kickers. And it has uh, three different ones with all the different combinations of the basic resources. And having those additional doubles in her kit is really nice, especially when they can flat out pay for a firecracker or a flash of light and you can get that kicker. The last card in her kit is her signature ally, which is Wolverine. Let's talk about Wolverine. Wolverine is a four cost, one, three, four statted ally whose attack gained piercing. We've seen this before. However, his response is a little different. They incorporate his healing so that whenever Jubilee flips into Alter Ego, I guess, well, whenever anyone controlling him flips into Alter Ego, he gets a heal three damage. This is, when evaluated in a vacuum, a really good ally. 
It has major damage output. It can stay around for pretty much any forever. You can sidekick them. It's pretty good sidekick. But through my plays, I've come to realize that I rarely get them to the table because when I have to pay for Wolverine, I'm not usually able to then pay for an event to status lock the villain. And then when the villain is attacking, Jubilee either wants to status lock or she loves chump lockers. And that's just not gonna be the four cost Wolverine that we just put onto the table. So what I have found in my plays is that this ally can be a little bit awkward to play. And once you're built out with her glasses and her desire to stun using firecrackers, she has a decent bit of damage already in her kit. So the damage that Logan brings to the table is not the most impactful I've seen. But when I can sneak them in with like a call for backup or something like that, I am pretty happy because it's nice. You can use them to clear minions. So it's not, I'm not saying that he's bad. I'm just saying that in my plays and the way that I have found that I enjoy and think of Jubilee being strong, Lo Logan has a hard time fitting into that equation. And that kind of leads us into our next section here, which is Jubilee's cost curve. So if you want to know more about the cost curve, you can check out the, uh, the video right here that Villain Theory and I did on the topic. But Jubilee's cost curve is in the top 10 highest cost curves in the game with an average of 2.17 per card. Usually, and this is another fun little section of the video, usually I see this as a weakness. But I don't actually know if that's true in this case because of her upgrades would deal with how much you pay for cards. You kind of want expensive cards so that you can get more value out of your upgrades. So it's a little weird kind of uh, relationship here, right? If you combine, if you if you you if you have low cost cards, you're not getting as much of an impact on your upgrades because they are exhaustible cards. So you kind of want to be playing these big or high cost cards, and her kit has those, and so. I'm not, I'm not too upset with that, especially when you combine it with the fact that she came with three extra doubles in her kit. She has a resource generator printed on her hero side, starting out the game with. I'm not too upset to see this high number here. I haven't found it to be too much of a hindrance. Let's look at some of the basic cards that I like to run with Jubilee. Now, these are cards that I typically like to look at putting into all or most of my deck builds with Jubilee, regardless of aspect. The first one up is multi-talented and or hit and run. This is so, so good with Jubilee. Now, typically I am running multi-talented over hit and run with her, but I did want to mention the latter, but these cards can trigger both her coat and her glasses. And since multi-talented is three cost, we can get some major output from these upgrades. Multi-talented, I view as pretty much her 16th, 17th, and 18th card for her deck. Since she does get benefits for paying for events with different icons, I pretty much am always looking at like X-Gene, which feels like it was just printed for her, and X-Jet to generate those wild resource icons. So if I am stuck with a hand of all physicals, I can use those wilds to offset that and maybe get that status lock condition going. Uh, so I usually am running one, probably both of those. Next up, let's talk about Utopia. Utopia is kind of interesting here because it, it does two things for us. It opens up our ally slot and it, so we can have four allies. And it also has a response saying that we can ready if we play an X-Men ally or an X-Men ally enters play. So typically I am more excited about the ready in Utopia for Jubilee because if we are going up against a steady or a stalwart villain, then we are using our allies to chump block a lot. Jubilee doesn't have a great defense. So we're using allies to chump block and therefore they're not hanging out for too, too long. So that extra ally slot is not as impactful. But if we can ready Jubilee, we're readying a resource generator so we can exhaust, pay for another event, or maybe even utilize that two thwart that she now has with her coat. That being said, there are some builds out there against the, what let's call them normal villains, which can be status locked that can exploit allies. And this extra, uh, this extra ally slot is great when we're in that situation. A lot of my games, the villain doesn't really activate. I'm confusing when I'm about to flip down and I'm stunning when I'm staying up, which means that our allies get that impact where they can, they don't have to chump lock. And so opening up that ally slot is a really nice benefit at that point. 
Uh, I do like endurance in her kit. Getting 33% more health is going to be amazing for her. Uh, she dies less often when that happens. Um, and as you can probably tell, there are a good number of basic cards we like to run in Jubilee. And we didn't even mention allies yet. But that does open up the discussion around the power in all of us. Even though we don't hit the... Even if we don't hit the rule of thumb of like 10 cards that we want to be able to use the power in all of us so that we include it in the deck, I still will look to run it more frequently than not because of the wild resource icons and all the benefits that that does bring to Jubilee. The last thing that I want to mention here, and this is, I guess, just the best section that I could figure out to put it in, um, she does have a lot of superpower cards in her kit. So I would normally talk about Death Focus here as being something that I would like to run with her, but I don't really run it in her because it reduces the cost and it doesn't pay it doesn't allow her to pay for cards so if you reduce a firecracker by one you cannot get the kicker and so death focus is a card where you see a huge number of superpower cards in her kit and you're like heck yeah let's go but for the for the most part i am not actually using death focus because i do want to actually pay the full cost for her events to get either the kicker or the upgrade uh additional benefits so Let's move on to the aspects. So what we're going to do is we're going to rank the aspects in terms of what she is least good in into what she is best in. And we're going to start out with fourth place, which is aggression. Aggression is here in fourth place. Um, I like that we have ways to stun and confuse with like dropkick and Psylocke in aggression to help with the status lock she does want to run. We also have some pretty great synergy with like damage boost effect cards, her grand finale attack, and like uh, hone techniques she can pull off really easily. But I have found that with her glasses, with her grand finale, and with her firecracker, damage is something that... I, I like to play a control game with Jubilee. I like to be able to control and maintain the pacing of the game. And so I, I'm not really rushing with Jubilee. And I find that if I am able to maintain control of the game, I don't necessarily need more damage, which is what aggression just provides as the aspect choice. In third place, we have Protection. I think that Protection and Aggression are pretty neck and neck here. Aggression provides more access to Confuse, but Protection gives her access to Readies, which allows her to generate more resources. And it's a little bit more flexible, especially when going up against those stalwart villains. So Protection allows us to have a little bit more um, robustness and readies and healing and ways to get generate toughs so that we can protect Jubilee. The bottom two aspects are pretty set apart from the top two in my opinion. So like I think of them kind of like tied in both aspects but the top two aspects are just like much better <laughs> than the bottom two. And in second place we're going to talk about justice. Justice is really good especially because of float like a butterfly. It allows you to flip, it gives you more access to Confuse, but Justice has damage options now. And with her ability to increase damage to Confused enemies with Float Like a Butterfly, you're able to capitalize on her status conditions as well as the multi-instance damage attacks. The coat is also just amazing to clear with threat. So with her already good ability to do that, let's just double down on it and run one way or another, getting us more cards, more access to her events, which are really good. Status lock the villain, go to town. Justice is really good with Jubilee. But in first place, it's leadership. And to be fair, she is an X-Men, so it's probably going to be hard for any aspect to beat out Uncanny X-Men. Just such a, such a great card. Leadership also enables her to get out multiple allies so that she can have more of defensive strategies when it comes to those pesky, steady, and stalwart villains. You can chump block, you have cheaper allies, make the call. There's just a lot of options that help protect Jubilee and Uncanny X-Men is a stupidly good card. <laughs> so the community, uh, I, I put out polls on the community tab on YouTube. The community voted that Justice was by far the top aspect choice for her, which is, I think, fair. I just think it's going to be really hard for any X-Men to not have leadership in that top spot now that we have so much support for allies and X-Men. Uh, yeah. 
there's a there's another poll where I put out kind of a power ranking of her and the community placed her in the B tier with maybe like a slight skew towards the high end of B tier towards that A. And I'm going to agree with them here and drop her into B tier between Miss Marvel and Gamora. Jubilee is a hero that took me a while to learn how to play and she has some really fun and interesting abilities. Paying for cards with different resources, a fun new lever to pull, which opens up some interesting strategies. I do love her upgrades. I really love the idea of getting the benefits based off of the events that you play, and it now allows you to view some of these events through a different lens and open up some events that you may not have played with other heroes because they may be a little bit more expensive, but with the upgrade, you get that benefit of paying for the expensive uh event i really like that i think that she will be similar to miss marvel whereas more and more events are printed she will get better and better and it's going to be a hero that we continuously come back and say like okay how does this event affect miss marvel how does this event affect jubilee that's really fun and i like that she's kind of built into the longevity of the game because events are not going to go away those are always going to be card types we have steady and stalwart Let's talk about this. It can hinder her very, very badly. And unlike some of the other characters that feel similar, I'm, I'm mainly thinking of Miles Morales here, her cards are more expensive and she has less defensive options, which really hinders her when it comes to those matchups. See, she does not have a defense card or an ally in her kit that's a good option for chump blocking. Her main defense is her status conditions. So when that is not available, we have to go the route of chump blocking. And when we're playing allies, we're not playing of events, which is what she's kind of based around. And that forces our hand with deck building, which can be a little hard, especially when you look at her style of play and it feels like we need to flood her deck with events. So it's a little bit counterintuitive when building that deck, going up against the steady and solar villains, which we are seeing more and more of these days. And so that can be really, really tough. I played a lot of matchups against sour villains and it can be mean that being said when she is up against someone she can status lock she shines the overall ranking of b would be drastically drastically different if we didn't have stalwart villains in the game if you could status lock every single villain she would be very very powerful she can apply that pressure she can pretty much negate any villain that is susceptible to status lock and it's kind of trivial sometimes because you get so good and you can just like never let them activate. Play her against Ebony Maul and see if you can not let Ebony Maul activate. It's fun. The last thing I will say before we move on to multiplayer thoughts is I want to talk about Shopping Spree. I wanted to like it more than I actually did. It seems hard to pull off without building directly for it. And if you build directly for it, I'm not sure if the, the, the juice is worth the squeeze there. Um, it can be amazing to get those hero specific upgrades out quickly, but it feels a little clunky in solo. I usually will pull it out, maybe clear it once and then either let it sit there or let it like be an option to like catch master plan and just thin my deck. That being said, let's transition to multiplayer thoughts because it can be so much more fun here. In multiplayer, I think Jubilee is amazing. I really, really like Jubilee in multiplayer. You can play her as, as a great support hero. You can pair her with so many really cool partners to help them get their items that are in the hero specific kit onto the table very easily to clear shopping spree. The threat of shopping spree is a flat two. It's not two per player. So if you're playing two players, you can clear shopping spree turn one and get that item. So whether that's going to be your coat or Captain America's Super Soldier Serum, you can get it onto the table turn one, which can really accelerate the build. And you don't have to, you don't have the added pressure of needing to flip up with Jubilee so that you can, you know, not scheme out in true solo, which means that you just have so much more flexibility and she can be just a great support character. The other nice thing about multiplayer is that Jubilee is really good when it comes to status conditions, really good at threat removal, all of this stuff. So if you can have someone else at the table that can help protect her either through just like a basic protection package or allies, she can really lean into her events and not worry too much about the defensive side of the game. She's gonna be a really nice asset to the table. So there it is. That is the review of Jubilee. It took me a little bit longer to get out. I uh, I had to, I wanted to try and get it out before I started all my travel and I just like, I 
didn't feel like I had played her enough <laughs> to be able to do a review on her. But that, that it is. Let me know what you think about Jubilee in the comments. I am really looking forward to this because I think that um, from some of the people I've talked with, they've struggled with Jubilee. I struggle with Jubilee. I really enjoy Jubilee, but it's also, I want to feel powerful. And until more recently, it was it was kind of hard to find the lanes on how to play Jubilee. But once I found them, I'm like, I'm really enjoying her. She's not my favorite solo hero, but I do love her in multiplayer. She will probably be one that I build for when I'm going to like a kind of heroes type event because her in multiplayer, passing out toys, I really like her in that supportive role. She she can be a lot of fun there. So let me know what you think about Jubilee down in the comments. I look forward to chatting with you all about her there. But until next time, hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. We'll see you around. Peace.